If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Peter 2 to read a scripture um, that's going to set us up for where we're going to go today. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be on the wall behind me. But this is what it says. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And in our teaching series, our community confessions, as we are going through our core values as a church, today we're going to be talking about the core value of identity. And our confession is that we are secure in Christ. You know, one of the most famous lines in literature comes from William Shakespeare's venerated theatrical classic, Romeo and Juliet. And this famous line is the scene where Juliet is naively trying to convince Romeo that this long-standing feud between their two families, the Capulets and the Montagues, it just boils down to something as silly and dismissible as a name, right? In this scene, this is what she says. She says, oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And she's not saying, where are you? She's not like looking for him, but wherefore in Renaissance English meant why. So she's saying, why are you Romeo? She says, deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Thou art thyself though, not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. And then she delivers this famous line. She says, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. That was my formal audition for Romeo and Juliet. What do you guys think? Do you think I have a future? I'm just kidding. I'm going to stick. Um, but in this scene, Juliet, she's trying to diminish the, the weight and the significance of his name. She's trying to say it doesn't really matter that much, but of course we all know the ending to this story. What's in a name really did matter. And these two star-crossed lovers ended up losing their lives in the process. And as much as Juliet tried to believe otherwise, names really do matter. What we call ourselves is how we identify ourselves. And identity is central. It's a core question that we as human beings are constantly asking, who am I? Names matter. You know, as Brandon and I were naming our three children, we took a lot of time to look into what the meaning of our children's names were. Our daughter, Finley, Finley means fair-headed warrior. Carson Leon, our middle son, Carson Leon means son of the rock and lion. So I think we did it to ourselves because we have a strong and fierce little man in Carson Leon. And then we have Archer Calvin, which means brave and bold. And if you've ever gone to the playground with Archer Calvin, you see this fleshed out because he will jump off the top of the playground and not even think twice about it. He usually has a bruise somewhere on his body because that kid is fearless. But names have so much significance. My name is Delaney Elizabeth Woodward, and my maiden name was McKee. And Delaney means descendant of the challenger. Elizabeth means God is my oath. And it is a name that has been passed down for generations in my family. The firstborn girl in my family um, receives the middle name Elizabeth. So for me, my mom, my grandma, and my great-grandma, and now my daughter Finley, we all share the same middle name. And my maiden name, McKee, um, comes from the Scottish Mackay, which is what my heritage is. And so names have so much power. But here's a little fun fact about me that not a lot of people know. My name was almost not Delaney. My name was going to be something different. When my parents were pregnant with me, it was the 80s, and so they were scouring through name books trying to find the perfect name for their little girl. And they spent months trying to, what's my firstborn daughter? What are we going to call her? This has to be the perfect name, the most exquisite and beautiful name to represent this gift that God has given us. And they were trying to find something biblical. That was a big priority of theirs. So they finally found the most beautiful, perfect exquisite name that they could think of. They were going to name me Talitha. Is anyone in here named Talitha? 
Okay, good, I can talk about this name. I was always a little bit worried, but Talitha, you guys. And they had good intentions because Talitha is a biblical name. When Jesus is raising the little girl from the dead, he says, Talitha, kum. And that means little girl, arise. And some translations say that it means little lamb, arise. So it's a beautiful idea, right? They're going to be like, little girl, arise, like Talitha. Now my grandma, her name is Joy Dove. That's literally her name, Joy Dove. And it's the perfect name for the sweet and tender and warm and wonderful woman that she is. But let me tell you something I learned early on about my grandma. My grandma's a real one. And she had my back in this because the moment that my parents went to my grandma Joy Dove and they said, hey, we found the perfect name for our baby girl. Your first granddaughter is going to be named Talitha. Do you know what Joy Dove did? Joy Dove got in her sedan and drove herself down to the animal shelter and adopted a dog and named it Talitha because she was like, my daughter will not name her daughter after grandma's dog. And that's true. My parents changed course after that. This is a true story, not making it up. You can call up Joy Dove after this if you want. So Joy Dove um, is amazing. She's a gangster and I owe her. And I grew up with Talitha. I used to play with Talitha. Talitha would come over to my house all the time. And every time I saw Talitha, I was reminded of how savage my grandma is. I'm like, respect, Joy Dove. You're a real one. Thank you for having my back. Talitha Woodward just isn't the vibe, I don't think. (laughs) Names matter. Names are what identify us. And beyond the name that you're given at birth... There's a lot of names and labels that we wear that are either put on us or that we put on ourselves, good and bad, right? Names are things that we carry with us, and it's how we are identified. And one of the greatest questions that we as human beings ask ourselves is the question, who am I? This is the great question that we all wrestle with. It's why we love taking personality tests like Myers-Briggs and, you know, StrengthsFinder. It's why we gravitate towards people who are like us because being around similar people makes us feel seen and known and understood. Names, labels, it all matters so deeply. And all of us wear different labels. We all wear different names. And it looks differently for everyone, but I'll give you a few of mine. This is taken straight out of my Instagram bio because that's where you put who you really are in your Instagram bio. Um, One name that I wear is mom. I'm a mom, I've got three kids and they're wild and amazing and wonderful. Another name identity that I wear is wife. I'm married to Brandon for 10 years. This is one of the identities that I have. Uh, Pastor, this is my professional job, but this is also the calling that I have that I believe that God has called us to do. Um, amateur chef. I love to cook. It's a huge part of who I am. I love cooking. It's therapeutic for me. And maybe one day I'll be a real chef. Probably not. But who knows? What, wherever the Lord leads, we'll see. But these are names that I wear. These are identities that frame who I am. And for all of us, we wear different labels and different identities to identify us to the outside world. And it looks different for all of us. I'm going to go through a few things that for many of us, Um, This is areas where we can find and derive a sense of identity. For a lot of us, we find identity from our past. Maybe from your family of origin, your upbringing, the way you were raised, the expectations that were placed on you from your family of origin. Brandon has talked about this before, but I grew up in a family of runners. And we would go on like family runs and family bike rides for fun. And it wasn't fun for me ever. And one thing, one expectation that was placed on me from a young age, whenever we would go on a family run, my dad would just like say, okay, we're going to run this long, we're going to run to this distance. And if I ever got tired and wanted to slow down a little bit, this was the, the language and the verbiage of my family. My dad would turn around and he would say, hey, McKees don't walk. So I went and found a Woodward because Woodward's walk. And I like my Woodward's and I'm happy to be a part of this family now. We don't run. We eat good food, and we hang out. We live our lives. But expectations that were put on you, this can come from your family of origin. Also, like family culture that you carry with you can become part of your identity. Family dysfunction that you've experienced that maybe has become part of your identity, who you are. Other things in the past that can identify you might be something that happened to you, maybe a traumatic event or something painful that you still carry with you. It can also be something that you did, 
Like if you did something in the past that you still carry with you, and it is part of your identity now. Other things we can find identity in. We can find identity in things that have been spoken over us. If someone has said something to you, we know that words have the power of life and death. We are created in God's image, and God created the world. He spoke the world into existence. We have that creative power in the way that we speak. And if someone speaks something over you, it can define the rest of your life. Maybe you've heard you're not good enough. Maybe you've heard you're not smart enough, you're not skinny enough, you're not pretty enough, you're a disappointment. These things we can carry with us, and it can become part of our identity. Other things we find identity in, this is a big one here in our context, is your work. Right? The quintessential DC question, what do you do? This is how we learn about each other. This is how we measure each other up. And the temptation when work is your identity is to believe that you are what you do. And that that's your whole identity is in what you do, professionally speaking. So you may think like, I am a government employee. I am a consultant. I am a lawyer. Fill in the blank for whatever it is for you. But your work is really not your full identity. It's part of what you do with your day, but it cannot possibly sum up everything about who you are as a human. Because on the other side of that, maybe you're struggling to find a job and you no longer are, I am unemployed, but now I am unemployable. And it begins to form who you are and your identity. Your performance can be a big one for people. I struggle with this, just being vulnerable. Your performance I, becoming part of your identity. And thinking that if I do well at something, or if I have a good day, then I am a success. Conversely, if I do badly, if I miss the mark, if I don't perform at my best, then I am a failure. Or maybe if I look good and present myself in a certain way, then I am lovable. But on the other side of that, if I have a bad day or if I'm off, then I am not lovable. And we can tend to put our performance as a core of our identity. Your academics can be an identifier. I'm a grad student. I'm a PhD. I'm a JD. Whatever that may look like. But on the other side of the pendulum, it could be, well, I, I'm not educated. I didn't go to college. Or maybe I... I dropped out of high school, and that becomes part of your identity, how you view yourself, your politics. This is a big one. We allow politics to become our identity. I am a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm an Independent, but I want to encourage you with this, church, and this is so critical that we understand this as the body of Christ. We have to know that ideology does not equal identity. It never can and it never will. It may be a strongly held conviction and it may believe, be something that you believe at the core of who you are, but it can never possibly sustain the weight and gravitas of your entire identity. And there's so many more things that we can find identity in, from your age to your culture to your gender to your citizenship status, whatever it might be for you. These names, these labels, these identities that we wear, this is how we present ourselves to the world. This is how they see us. And often, if we're not careful, we believe the cultural narrative that says this is who we are. But it's reductive to say that one component of your complex intricate and nuanced humanity is your whole identity. Because being Brandon's wife is a big part of my life, but it's not my whole identity. It's an identifier and it's part of who I am, but it's not everything about who I am. And if we are in Christ, which the assumption is in a room like this, that's what we're all after, is to be in Christ, then these things can never be the totality of our identity. So then we're left with one really big question. So what is? What is our identity? And this message that I'm about to share is written under the presumption that we all consider the word of God to be the infallible, inerrant foundation of our lives. And this is the place from which we get all of the answers to our questions. We get direction and guidance, clarity and truth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to turn to these pages and we're going to see what the word of God has to say about our identity. We're going to go back to the very beginning and I'm going to warn you for a moment. We're going to take a theological deep dive for a few minutes. We're going to come back up for air at the end and it's going to be great. But we're going to go deep here and I want to take you guys through what scripture says about our identity. Genesis 1, it tells us that we are made in God's image. Genesis 1:27 says, so... 
God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, this verse, this short verse, Genesis 1:27, is loaded with theology of identity. And there are three very important things that I want us to understand as we look at scripture. The very beginning, the origins of mankind. Three critical things that we must understand. The first is this. We see here, God created us. So he is the author of our identity. Did man create man? No, it says God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. God is our creator and thereby he is the source of our identity. And this is found throughout the narrative of scripture. Isaiah 64, eight, you Lord are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Isaiah 45, nine, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Romans 9.20, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? God created us, and it's critical we understand that. Because what that means is that as human beings, his creation, we are ontologically dependent on God. What does that mean? University of Warwick breaks it down like this. An entity ontologically depends on another entity if the first entity cannot exist without the second entity. And this is our relationship to God, right? Ontologically independent identities like God, on the other hand, can exist all by themselves. For example, the surface of an apple cannot exist without the apple and so depends on it ontologically. This is the nature of our relationship on God. We, we do not exist without God, so therefore we have an ontologically dependent relationship on God. So that's the first truth that we pull out of Genesis 1:27. God is the creator of our identity. The second truth is this. Genesis 1:27 says that we were created in his image. So what that means, being created in God's image means that humanity has tremendous inherent value. Humanity has tremendous inherent value. Why? Because we are created in the image of Almighty God. What does this mean? It means every human, every race, every generation, male and female, no exceptions. Every human made in the image of God has divine significance because we were created to reflect our Creator. It's important that we understand this. Every human has tremendous inherent value. And the third thing that we understand from Genesis 1:27 is this. We're the image of God. There is no image without an original. And I'm going to share a thought from Pastor Tim Keller in New York. He says this. He says, when something is in the image of something, it means it is a representation or a reflection of something else. Okay, so we're made in God's image, and there is no image without an original. As an image bearer, we are a reflection and a representation of something else. And so to be made in the image of God means that we do not generate our own identity, but rather we have to reflect that of God's. And if we do not reflect that of God's, we are creating an idol in our own image. So what does this mean? It means that we either reflect God, which was what we were created to do, or we reflect something in the created order. And that's idolatrous in the sense that we are now making an image of the image of God in our own making, in our own design, and in our own fashioning. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Creating our own identity is at its core idolatrous. We are taking the work of God and manipulating it in a way that we feel fit and appropriate. But our identity is discovered in who we were created to reflect. Richard Lentz in his book, Identity and Idolatry, says this. The irony of identity is that by looking away from ourselves, we are more likely to discover our identity. As an image is contingent upon the object for its identity, so the imago Dei is contingent upon God for its identity. Human identity is rooted in what it reflects. So this is how we were created to be, to be made in the image of God. This was God's perfect plan. And yet, 
We all know that sin was introduced into the picture and that image became warped. No longer did we perfectly reflect that which we were created to reflect. Sin fractured the relationship between God and mankind. And the law was then given, we all know the story, the law was given as a means to kind of bridge that gap back. We were fallen, we were imperfect, we were no longer a perfect representation and reflection of God who is sinless and perfect. So there was the law that was put into place to give us a tool to try to achieve the righteousness to become more like Jesus through the way that we lived our lives. But as we all know, the law was difficult if not impossible to keep. And very few people, if any, ever were able to live lives of perfect holiness just like God. And so it's a hopeless situation, but then enter Jesus. And the scripture tells us that Jesus, the son, was the image of the invisible God. So while we were a fractured and broken image of God, Jesus comes onto the scene and is the perfect representation of God. He lived a sinless life. He never failed. He never missed the mark. Everything that he did was perfectly representative of who God was. And then he died on our behalf to forever close the gap between God and humanity and give us the new identity of being in Christ. The salvation we have through Jesus gives us this new identity. So we're in, made in the image of God, but we are also in Christ. When we accept the gift of salvation, this gives us a new identity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. When you are in Christ, you receive a new identity. And the word that he uses here for has gone, when he says the old has gone, this is a Greek word, parekamai. And I believe that has gone is not even strong enough of a translation of it. What it means is to pass away and to perish. He's essentially saying the old you is dead. You are dead to yourself. You now have a whole new identity. The new has come. Paul reinforces this concept in Galatians. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is violent language. The old me, the old self, my old identity has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And it's critical that we understand this. This new identity that you have of being in Christ is based solely on Christ's performance, not yours. And just like being made in the image of God, when you are in Christ, this is an identity that can only be received and never achieved, which means it has nothing to do with you. And that's a beautiful gift. I think when we're talking about identity and we're wrestling with these human questions that we've had throughout human history of who am I, I think understanding this truth, we're asking the wrong question. Rather than asking ourselves, who am I? We need to be asking ourselves, who is he? Who is the one that I'm created to reflect? Who is the one that I'm supposed to live my life in stride with? I need to have an understanding and a revelation of who my God is so that I can live up to the identity that I have in Christ. The Expositor's Bible Commentary says this. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means to be so united to Christ that all the experiences of Christ become the Christian's experiences. When one died with Christ, one's old self died with Christ. This was arranged by God so that Christ, rather than the old Paul or the old Delaney or the old Tiffany or the old Aaron, rather than we are living, now Christ might live in him. True, Paul is still living. But he adds that the life he lives now is lived by faith. So when you're in Christ, that means that you are assuming a new identity. No longer are you you, you are now an heir. You are now a son or daughter of the living God. You are now a citizen of heaven. You have a whole new framework, a whole new identity, a whole new understanding of who you are in this divine cosmic experience of life that we're a part of. You have a new identity. And we have to understand that when we're in Christ, we're assuming this identity and therefore we are laying down every other. Ephesians 4 tells us, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self 
created to be like God and in true righteousness and holiness. This word self that he's using here refers to personhood or identity. And this is the same principle that Jesus talked about when he was talking with Nicodemus that night. When he said, Nicodemus, if you want to follow me, you have to be born again. The old you is gone. There is a new you that is being regenerated through your standing in Christ. And what is the identity of that new person? It's what we just read here in Ephesians 4.24. We are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Expositor's commentary says this. Their previous lifestyle was to be discarded completely. They must forsake their old behavioral haunts and indeed lay aside the costume of their unregenerate selves. The new self assumed by the believer is the direct opposite of the worthless old self. It is not the former nature refurbished, but a totally new creation. The characteristics of the divine image are righteousness and holiness. These are qualities in God that are reproduced in his genuine worshipers. His love of right and his aversion to sin. This is our new identity. And let me tell you, you're never going to perfectly live up to the standard of perfection. But the beautiful thing about being in Christ is we've been given the righteousness of Christ. Through his sacrifice and death on the cross, we now stand before God in our new identity. The last thing I'll say on this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, when you've completely given up yourself to his personality, you will then for the first time in your life be developing into a real person. He made the whole world he invented it as an author, invents characters in a book, all different men that you and I were intended to be. Our real selves are, so to speak, all waiting for us in him. What I call myself now is hardly a person at all. It's mainly a meeting place for various natural forces, desires, and fears, etc. Some of which come from my ancestors, some from my education, some perhaps from devils. The self you were really intended to be is something that lives not from nature, but from God. So what does this mean for us? We are made in the image of God. We are in Christ. Well, that just means there's a whole reorientation of how we look at our identity. It means that we take all of these pieces about who we are, all these various labels and names and identities that we wear, and we understand that now most important part of who we are is that we're made in the image of God. That's our new identity. And even more importantly, now, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we are in Christ. And this is the label that we wear that triumphs over every other label and every other identity in our lives. And now what we understand is that my identity is now from and for God. And what this doesn't mean is that I am no longer any of these things, right? These things can still be identifiers of me, but ultimately every one of these identifiers submits to my ultimate identity of being found in Christ. And here's the important thing that a lot of us don't really like, is that if any of these other identifiers come into conflict with our ultimate identity of being in Christ, they must submit to our ultimate identity. Because this is what it means to lay down your life. This is what it means to deny yourself, to pick up your cross daily and follow after him. It means laying down of your life and surrendering it completely to his lordship and to his leadership. We are in Christ and this is our new identity. So why does this matter? Why is this something that we have valued enough to make one of our church's seven core values? When we say that we are secure in Christ and we have a prevailing and pervasive sense of identity that goes beyond paycheck and politics and position and performance. And man, we could come up with a lot of other great alliteration to drive that point home. But why is it something that we value so much as a community? Well, I think there's a couple big reasons why. And I'll close with that today. When we don't understand the true source of identity, a couple things happen. One is that we have a temptation to devolve into division. When you've allowed other identifiers in your life to become the supreme identity of your life, you have a tendency to accept the doctrine that the world has cultivated, that of tribalism. 
that I am a part of this group, this is the foremost identity of my life, and then you have a tendency to be pulled into those separate tribes, and what happens when you're in tribes is you have a fear and a mistrust of those that are outside of your tribe. And so when you have an understanding of your ultimate identity in Christ, and that's number one in your life, then you understand that all of these other things are identifiers and they're part of who I am, but they do not dictate the way that I interact with the world around me. And the beautiful thing about the message of Jesus and the hope of the gospel is that your standing in Christ is inherently unifying. When we are in Christ, we are made one, even though we have different backgrounds and expressions and races and genders, we come together under the singular banner of Christ and that is what makes us one. In Galatians, Paul says, in Christ Jesus, here's your new identity, you are all children of God. We have the same dad, guys, spiritual dad. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, this is who we're claiming, this is who we say we are. We have clothed ourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is what the church can and should look like. This is the greatest dream of our hearts, that this church you can look around and you can see people who do not look like you, who think differently from you, who would fill out a ballot differently than you would, who you may disagree with on some things in your life, but ultimately you agree upon the most important thing that defines who you are, and that is your standing in Christ. That ultimately, that is your ultimate allegiance. We're not citizens of this world. If you're in Christ, we're citizens of heaven. That is what defines who we are. And you don't devolve into identity when you have an understanding of who you are. You say, these are my brothers and these are my sisters and I will fight for unity in the body. But when we don't have an understanding of our true identity, we have a tendency to devolve into division. Another thing that can happen when we don't have an understanding of our identity is we're so much more easily shaken. You know, there's that story in the Bible of the wise man building his house on the rock and the foolish man building his house on the sand. And when the wind blew and the rain came, the house that was built on the sand was washed away. But the house that was built on the rock stood firm. And in a lot of ways, I think many of us have a tendency to build our identities on the sand, on various things that can all be taken away. And the question is, when and if those other identities are taken from you or shaken, who are you on the other side of it? I'll give you a few stories as examples. Some of you know that before I was in ministry, I worked for the mayor of Albuquerque and I loved my job. I was so passionate about it. I worked a lot of hours, probably too many. I worked on the weekends. I had the two phones. I was always on call and I loved it. I took great fulfillment, great satisfaction from my work. I believed in his policies and his platforms. As a, as a politician, I was behind him and I was just so excited about the future of our city and where he was taking it. But one day I was offered a job at our church to come on staff to be a youth and young adults pastor alongside Brandon. And um, it didn't take much thought for me. I, I resigned my position with the mayor so that I could step full time into ministry because I knew that the ultimate calling of my life was ministry. I love people, I love the church, and this is what I really wanted to do. And so it was hard, it was a hard decision to step away from something I loved so much, but it was a decision I knew I needed to make. Now fast forward a couple years, and the mayor that I worked for, he termed out of office. So he concluded his second term, and my coworkers, a lot of them who I worked with, um, a few of them really kind of had a really hard time because they were out of a job now, and there's a bit of an identity crisis. When you've attached that much of who you are into this work that really is meaningful and incredible, but then it's just not there anymore. And the person that you worked for no longer is in power. And I watched as some of my coworkers truly had a bit of an identity crisis. And they began to wonder, like, who am I in this city? Who am I at this chamber of commerce luncheon? Like, I used to sit at the head table, and now I, I, no one even cares. Who am I professionally? And I, I watched as they walked through this, and I, I felt sad for them. And it honestly... It reinforced to me the fire that I still have today that I was able to walk away from that job and still be secure because my identity was based on something unshakable. That regardless of whether or not the mayor had continued on in office, I would be okay. Because I know who I am. Regardless of my job, 
regardless of who's in office. Another example of this that took place for me and Brandon recently, in 2020, um, we had been, like I had mentioned, youth and young adults pastors for years, and we loved it. Our whole lives were hanging out with teenagers and going to football games and going on college campuses and making TikToks. We got into TikToks. They weren't very good or funny, but we tried, and um, that was our whole life, and we loved it. We loved what we did. But in 2020, um, we started to prepare to come here. And so we transitioned the ministries to different people to lead them. We stepped back. We kind of were like in between jobs, I guess, if you will, because we were really just focusing all of our energy into this, into launching this church. And so for about a year, we just kind of were. We weren't leading anything. We weren't pastoring. We weren't speaking. We were just kind of there. And it was a very disorienting time for us. It was hard because... In a lot of ways, it's easy, as we all know, to place your identity in what you do. But ultimately, we were okay. Because we knew that regardless of whether or not we were holding a microphone, or if we were leading people, or if we were ever going to see this church come to fruition, it was still a big question mark at that point in time. We knew we were going to be okay. Because our identity was not in anything other than our, our standing in Christ. For those of you that have kids, maybe you're a parent in the room, or maybe you're going to be one day. There's also a temptation to make your kids your identity because they're in your house and they're all consuming is putting it lightly. They consume all of your energy and all of your food and all of your money and all of your time and they are a lot. And it really takes all of your energy and all of your focus and it's such a, a intense season where your whole life is wrapped up in these little humans. But then the question is, what happens the day they turn 18 and walk out the doors to your house to start their own lives? Are you going to be okay? What is your identity in? You know, I want to be the kind of woman that when my kids walk on to their next adventure, I'm like, I'm proud of you and I'm cheering for you and I am good because I'm in Christ. I'm made in his image. I know who I am and I'm going to be okay. We cannot allow the things of this world to become our identity. Because if our identity is in anything other than Christ, it can be taken away and it can be shaken. And then the question is, who are you on the other side of that? Are you lost? Are you disoriented? Are you in the middle of an identity crisis? Or are you good? Because the rain can come and the winds can blow and all the things can take place, but you're standing on the rock because you built your life on the foundation of something that is unshakable. Being in Christ is the one thing that can't be taken away. And I want to ask you this question this morning. When it comes to the thing that you place your identity in, I want to invite you to consider the source. Consider the source. Maybe you've heard that phrase used before when someone's giving you a piece of information and then someone says, well, consider the source. And what they're saying is, is that source reliable? And is that source trustworthy? Because information can either be legitimized or delegitimized based on the source. What is the source of your identity? Is it reliable? And is it trustworthy? Finding your identity in Him is unshakable and it is sound. And I believe Satan is waging a very successful war against our collective sense of identity. He is. And he is causing us to place the weight of our identity onto anything and everything except for our standing in Christ. And anything else that you place the weight of your identity on other than Christ will buckle under the weight because no created thing was ever made to sustain the weight of identity. We are made in God's image. We are in Christ. And that is the unshakable source of everything about who we are. It brings us together in perfect unity. And ultimately, it is unshakable and gives us confidence and peace in our lives. I'll leave you today with this quote from C.S. Lewis from his book, Mere Christianity. He says, your real new self, which is Christ and also yours, and yours just because it is his, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. Does that sound strange? The same principle holds, you know, for more everyday matters. Even in social life, you will never make a good impression on people until you stop thinking about what sort of impression you are making. The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life 
and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. Would you bow your heads with me today? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of this new identity. That though it does require sacrifice and submission to your lordship and authority, that ultimately, God, it is the greatest gift because it gives us clarity, peace, confidence, and a sound mind, Lord. God, right now, we surrender every part of who we are to you. Holy Spirit, do what you need to do in our hearts to convict us where we have idolized identities in our lives above that of being found in Christ. Give us direction on how to reorient and recorrect areas of our lives that have been out of balance. God, ultimately, we trust you with our lives and with our futures. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.